and we went to Stangia, where we converted to Harvard Ones, very old Harvard Ones. It was uh, not like the Harvard Two. It was quite a vicious aeroplane, and from that on to Mohawks, and we all did about five hours or so on Mohawks, but. <clears throat> Uh, we did height climbs, and I think we were climbing up to about 25,000 feet. And then down again, just getting experience. And one of the chaps, Posner, or before him, somebody had gone up and decided he would dive down and see how fast he could go. The Mohawks were... French aircraft, they were destined for the uh, French Air Force, so they were marked in kilometres per hour, not knots. Anyway, this chap had gone up, and I don't know if it was, whatever it was, it was some high speed, something he'd done just under 800 or something indicated, in a vertical dive, full power. Posner went up the next day and he thought he'd try the same thing and go faster. And he didn't pull out. Whether he hit compressibility or what, I don't know, but he went straight in. We joined the squadron uh, about three days after Alamein. The first move from Alamein, we joined them. But I remember Alamein we could see the flashes of the guns for the, the artillery bombardment at night. You could see the whole sky, the, the lighting up of the bombardment. Anyway, we went up all the way up to Tunis. We did, stopped off at Martuba and did training there, and then after that we started on ops. We did an op and I hadn't got a clue what was going on. Jerry Herico was the uh, my number three, and I was his uh, number four. And he landed, he said, did you see that one and nine? I said, what, where, which? <laughs> we were uh, stationed at Cape Bon, and there we were going to get new aircraft. We had hoped we'd get Mustangs, but we got the RAF's discarded Spitfires. My aircraft had given trouble, so we had RAF mechanics there who were very well versed on the Spit. Our chaps were still battling. <coughs> and the RAF mechanic that I had said, this, that, and the next thing's wrong with your aircraft, when you get back, tell your mechanic what to do. <clears throat> I said, dead right. He said, it'll be all right, it'll get you back. Anyway, taxied out and somebody had been fiddling with my straps and they were very, very tight and high up. And they were so uncomfortably tight, I thought, oh, I'm going to take them off. And again, this little voice said to me, Wait, wait till you're airborne, then take them off. <clears throat> anyway, we lined up, uh, and we were taking off one at a time. And as I got airborne, lots of black smoke out the engine. Uh, now, what do I do? There were reeds ahead, and there was water. There was a lake beyond that. That now, if my engine cuts, I'll go into the water, and chances of survival, not good. So what do I do? And all these reeds in front of me, I thought, oh, nice soft belly landing. Chop, in, but what I didn't know, the reeds were about 25 feet high. So the aircraft sank in, and then a wing dropped and then it cartwheeled. Uh, 
pulled the tailplane off, pulled the uh, port wing off, and eventually came to rest on its side uh, where the port wing had gone. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, you know, it all happened very quickly. And I looked out and I could see all the fumes and so on from the engine. I thought, oh, this thing's going to burn out. Straps off, dead right. I'd remembered from the previous plane. Uh, and I got out, struggled to get out. And said, oh, you bloody fool, parachute. And that was on the wing. But I couldn't get away from the aeroplane. I remember looking in the cockpit. There was a little red warning light, a battery light, and all these bloody fumes and things. Uh, and I still had my helmet on with the oxygen tube holding me back. <laughs> and then to battle through these reeds, it, they were thick, thick, thick. And uh, you know, it was sort of breaking my way through. And once I was clear of the aircraft, I pulled out my revolver. I thought, I'll just let people know I'm okay. Fire off, go bang, bang, bang. And, oh, I was there for a long time, an hour or more. And Petey Bryant, and uh, he was my flight commander. He uh, came through with people looking, f looking for me. Uh, and, oh, RAF chap, South African in the RAF. I just can't remember his name now. But... Petey Bryant had come and this RAF chap came and he said, have you found the pilot? And he said, no. He said, well, is he in the aircraft? And Petey said, Bryant said, no, we can't, you know, this ammo is exploding, we can't get there. And this guy said, come on, we'll go and look. <laughs> So with the ammo exploding, they got themselves, must have been very close because of the reeds being so thick, they saw my parachute on, on the ground. They said, oh, well, he's out. And then they found it. My straps being so tight <clears throat> saved me. I was bruised, I was black and blue on my chest but no injuries, you know, after a crash like that, nothing. Anyway, uh, we carried on into Sicily doing very little flying, and then we moved to um, Foggia. Again, shortage of maps, <clears throat> taking off, Petey Bryant, I was in his flight, four of us taking off. On takeoff, Petey's engine cut and he plowed into the ground. Three of us, uh, Chum Cater, his aircraft behind me, and uh, Des Ducasse. But now the aircraft that had been given to me was the OC's aircraft. It, he had a Spit 5 and a Spit 9. I had no aircraft because I was a sprog. <laughs> so he said, you can take my aircraft. It doesn't give you full RPM on takeoff, but that's all right. Just open the throttle all the way. It'll get you airborne. It won't give you your <coughs> 2,800, but you'll get about 2,500. It'll be okay. Uh, at this stage, my glycol was in the red. And I thought, what do I do? I thought, no, I've got to go. So we opened up and just airborne, engine died. Uh, <clears throat> and I could see the end of the runway coming up, I would lift the undercarriage 
And I did, and on the spit you pull it down and then sideways and up. And I did this too quickly. And it, in the up, and it jumped back into the sort of neutral position. And uh, it, and the carriage hasn't collapsed, you know. And, and I looked down and I saw where it was and I realized what had happened. And I grabbed it and pushed it up. And as I looked up again, I saw the uh, marker. They had 44-gallon drums as aerodrome markers couple on this. And I was heading straight for this. Uh, and I decided to head to the side of it. And there was a lot of ammo parked. And there was a chap in amongst this ammo, counting it or something. And my wing sort of passed over the ammo, missed this, and then into a ditch and collapsed. This time I remembered everything. Lap straps, <laughs> parachute, harness, off. I hit the gun sight, that knurled ring on the gun sight, and it chewed me up. No pain. Interesting, no pain at all. And I hopped out, and of course the aircraft was on the ground, lots of dust and stuff on the wings, and I hopped out onto the wing and slipped with all this muck and gravel and dust, went down on my hands, and I took the skin off here as I went down, and that was the only pain I felt. Absolutely nothing here. And uh, I got out and <coughs> ran from the aircraft. But I thought it was going to burn. It didn't burn. But I thought it might. <coughs> the American, who I think had got the fright of his life, he came up to me. And I tried to speak to him, then I realized I couldn't speak because my lip had been cut, and, you know, the whole lip had fallen open. And as I'd gone, I'd sort of spitting things out, and I realized I was just spitting out teeth. And the, then he tried to lift this flap or lift my whole head up so the flap went back into place <clears throat> and that was the only time I spent I, I uh, felt pain and then it was here down my neck uh, I was quite badly damaged all over you know it cuts and bruises the spit cock but not like a Mustang Bits and pieces sticking around all over, and I must have sort of swirled around. I had cuts to my arm and just everywhere. Anyway, they whisked me off to hospital, and my first recollection, woke up the next morning, and who should be leaning over a sort of parapet next to my bed? Angus Annan White. <laughs> and... Gus, looking at me, a big grin in his face, he said, have you seen your face? I said, no, he said, it's the funniest thing I've seen. <laughs> and he went and grabbed a mirror. And, I, you know, I was still bloody and mucky. And he said, don't you get it's funny? <laughs> uh, anyway chatted for a bit and then he proceeded to tick me off he said how many times have I told you if you're going to crash forget the aeroplane because <clears throat> at that stage well that he'd crashed the same day as I had it was his eighth allied aircraft he'd either been shot down or crashed eight times <laughs> That put me out of action for a long time and then I went back to the squadron and picked up malarial jaundice 
and that was the end of my <clears throat> my tour.